The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. I'm Jameson Rabbit. And I'm all by my lonesome today, so once again, it's going to be a little conversation between you and I, uh, as I have a bunch of movies that I watched this week, and I'm really excited to tell you about some of them, and I'm really excited to warn you about one of them. We'll get into that in a moment, but I'm going to get us started with what we have on the marquee this week. And the first movie we're going to be discussing is the newest film in the Jackass franchise. It's Jackass Forever, otherwise known as the fourth venture into this universe. This is uh, directed by Jeff Tremaine. Uh, and this is the final bow for the Jackass gang that you know and love, led by Johnny Knoxville and Steve-O. Um, this is their fourth feature. Uh, it's been 10 years since the last time they did a film. And we bring back most of the guys. Uh, obviously, Ryan Dunn passed away in the interim, and Bam Margera has had... Uh, legal and uh, substance issues that have kept him uh, from being in any of this. But we also add a young crew, kind of a, the JV gang, uh, including a lady for the first time into the uh, Jackass universe. And these are all young uh, young folks who kind of grew up watching the, the films and the TV series, and they're here to kind of per perhaps have the torch passed to them and to participate and to be tested by the old crew. Um, and it, it's 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 exactly what you expect from one of these films. And for my money, I think Jackass is actually one of the strongest properties we've had. It's been around for 22 years now, including the MTV series, multiple films, uh, like just a groundbreaking series that also spawned multiple spin-off series. Um, it's just had a really, really strong run, and it's been very dependable. And we have seen this crew go through so much. Um, and in the grand tradition of these films, it opens with uh, an over-the-top sequence at the start of the film. Uh, this time, it's a very produced uh, sequence, uh, frankly, uh, a little nuts uh, in the beginning here. And, you know, it's your standard jackass. It's skits, it's snippets, it's stunts, uh, a lot of gross-out humor, so a lot of laugh-out-loud moments mixed with some scenes that really horrify you. Um, big produced pranks. And simple things that are just done, you know, really to just kind of pop each other there, just to make each other laugh. Uh, there is, as you see in a lot of this trailer here, a lot of trauma to the groin. So much trauma to the groin. And, uh, you know, just be, be, watch out. If you, have a, if you have an issue with it, there's, a, there's a, a ton of frontal male nudity in this. That shouldn't be a surprise to you, but it's kind of exactly what you'd hope for if you're a Jackass fan as far as these guys getting together. Johnny Knoxville showing why he's the star. He and Steve-O have put their lives and their sanity and their health on the line so many times. Uh, this one, uh, for my money, I think Danger Aaron. Aaron uh, was the star. He faced the most traumatizing events throughout this film. Uh, he provided huge laughs with his reactions. He and Dave are kind of the, the old-timers who feel like they have real trauma, uh, kind of have that thousand-yard stare. Uh, Pontius, Chris Pontius is back in this. He doesn't have a whole lot to do in this film, um, but it also this film uh, had me face one of my biggest fears, which was, uh, it was tough. There was a tough scene in here where I, I, uh, I was squirming in my seat. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like, it, you grade this on a scale because either you love these or you don't, I think. Either you get them or you don't understand them. And I think that uh, the directors, Jeff Tremaine and Spike Jones are kind of masters at this, at taking these videos and these pranks and really getting incredible shots that aren't always easy to get and always nailing the shot of the huge prank or what have you. Um, you know, and, and this this movie, it's men around 50 years old just getting battered. Um, and it felt like one last ride for the, for the original crew. Um, perhaps this new gang uh, is able to carry on uh, maybe with the old guard acting as mentors or producers. I'm not sure. I'm fine with this being it. Um, but I really enjoyed this new Jackass movie. And uh, boy, Johnny Knoxville with the silver hair just looking like uh, he's an old man ready to ride off into the sunset and stop being hit by a bull uh, constantly. And uh, so I, I enjoy it myself. I, I'm a fan of these films. And uh, I end up giving Jackass forever 
Uh, four out of five stars. It's a fun time. It's it, You might find it offensive and hate it. That's fine. That's fair. But uh, I enjoyed it. So I recommend it to all Jackass fans. Uh, the next movie I have on the marquee for you is the newest disaster sci-fi film from Roland Emmerich, who seems to really enjoy making this style of movie. Uh, it's called Moonfall. Uh, Moonfall stars Patrick Wilson as astronaut Brian Harper, Halle Berry as astronaut Joe Fowler, uh, and John Bradley uh, as Casey Houseman, who is a conspiracy theorist, kind of a con man, who discovers that the moon has somehow come off of its axis, and he wants to alert the world. Um, it, we, we see 10 years earlier, uh, we're in outer space, an unknown blob wiped out power on a, a space shuttle, killed one of the astronauts, um, and only Patrick Wilson and Halle Berry's characters survive. Cut to 10 years later, uh, Brian Harper is now a disgraced, recluse former astronaut. Uh, meanwhile, Joe Fowler, Halle Berry's character, is a bigwig at NASA. Uh, and when this conspiracy theorist finally is able to get the attention of someone to let them know, like, hey, there's big things going on here with the moon. Um, it's going to come crashing into Earth at some point. That's probably bad. Um, and it, in, in the in the setup, it's a lot like Don't Look Up, the uh, the film that we had uh, a couple months ago, Adam McKay's film. Um, in the in the setup of the disaster, will anyone believe him? You know, the big wigs don't want to believe what he's trying to say. Trying to say. Problem with this movie is this movie's real, real dumb. It's it's. The, the, the lead actors in this film, Patrick Wilson, Halle Berry specifically, are, are really terrible in this movie. John Bradley is serviceable as the comic relief, um, but it's his character that kind of uh, allows all of this craziness to happen to. And if the film morphs into a film where our three heroes get thrown together and somehow they're the only ones who can save the planet. Meanwhile, we drop in a bunch of extra drama about Brian's son, played by Charlie Plummer, who's been thrown in jail. Uh, there's some jealousy between between Brian and his ex-wife's new husband, played by Michael Pena, who's completely wasted in this film. Uh, we have the military, who's planning to uh, fire nukes at the moon. Uh, and unless this ragtag team of, of miscreants can take a space shuttle, literally a space shuttle out of a museum, and uh, launch that thing up to the moon in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, ridiculous. And uh, before the moon comes crashing into us. And to me, it's a two and a half hour movie. And it felt like it was a story that was told by a child. Because it constantly tried to one up itself. And it felt like listening to a child be like, and then this happened. And then this happened. Oh, and then this happened too. And it got crazier and crazier. You're like, that's all lies. This is a dumb story. And that's exactly what this is. It progressively got worse and worse and worse. And more cringeworthy. And more logic lapses. And it's just... It, I like disaster movies. I'm a fan of dumb disaster movies like San Andreas and such. This was really, really tough to get through. It tries to present itself as a smart film. That's the problem, is it wants to make you believe that it's a smart sci-fi film. And it is not. It failed spectacularly in that form. It's not a good sci-fi film. It's not a good disaster film. And it felt like... It felt like they thought that they were making Interstellar, especially in the second half of the film. It felt like Emmerich thought he was making Interstellar, but it's much more of a sci-fi original film. And I saw more believable things uh, recently when I rewatched Journey to the Moon, the uh, 1912 movie about the moon being made out of cheese. Be more believable storyline than Moonfall because it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm watching it and I'm thinking, there's a lot of big actors. Donald Sutherland is pulled in here. This man didn't deserve this. And it, it, I'm thinking there's no way anyone on the set of this film, working on this film, thought this is good. Yeah, we're making a good product. But it, it, it tried to go for an unearned ending at the end, which is just, it, I feel like after two and a half hours, they try to go for this really emotional ending, uh, really undeserved. It really irritates me, these things. And it just kind of tried adding stakes in the third chapter of this film. And it just, it was, it was way too late. And it just felt like a big budget goof, a huge big budget movie that was just, I don't know. It, it got me more and more mad. Thus my kind of rant about this movie. But nothing makes sense. And it, and it alternates between space stories and then going back to Earth to follow these kids around. 
you could have cut the entire kids wandering around storyline as they're trying to get safe and we're watching the astronauts' children together. Cut all that, save me 40 minutes of this movie uh, because I didn't care. And why, why would you care? And it's, uh, if, it felt to me as I was watching Moonfall like this was a movie that was made for someone who was trying to launder money. That's all it felt like was, because there's no way that this was made in, in all seriousness. Like it felt like this was a way for someone to just wash some money and uh, yeah, we'll make a movie. And it, because it wasted two and a half hours of my life, it definitely made me dumber. It made me question my vocation of watching and discussing movies. Like, what am I doing with my life that I'm sitting here spending two and a half hours watching this? If I had two more hours right now to sit and talk with you, I would love to do a deep dive scene by scene of how stupid this movie is. Uh, I would, it would be, nothing would please me more, but unfortunately I don't have that time and I wouldn't waste your time like these guys did. Um, it, it just, it's a movie that insults its audience. And like, there's, there's little things. These kids, as I mentioned, they're wandering through the mountains of Colorado during this. The moon is literally falling onto the earth. Uh, they get hijacked by some hillbillies. And uh, it, they realize, oh, I think my mom lives nearby. And they just walk through the mountains to show up at mom's house. Like, this is stupid. And then I mention these hillbillies because we have to introduce, randomly for no reason, a bunch of hillbillies who are hijacking th things just so that we can have a high-speed chase through the mountains as the moon is falling onto the earth, like it just felt like, yeah, we need a high speed chase. Let's, let's bring some of these guys in. Uh, just random decisions throughout this whole movie. And it just, it's a wasted effort. And I, I feel really bad, because I really like Michael Pena. I really like Donald Sutherland, he's a legend. And I feel like they should have had some more to do. They deserve better than this. Um, I don't know. So ultimately, I mean, no surprise, not a fan of this movie. Um, it, my ultimate, my ultimate kind of landing spot on this is movies like Battlefield Earth and Geostorm, these terrible, like, legendary bad movies, they've got company now because this is the worst movie I've seen in quite a while. It's a spectacular failure as entertainment, and it's the first zero-star movie that I'm giving this year. It's the worst movie I've seen in quite some time. So I highly do not recommend you go check out Roland Emmerich's Moonfall. Do not fall for the trap. It's not a good film. Uh, moving on, though, to something that is hopefully a little bit better. We go over to Hulu, uh, where there is a new film that just uh, dropped over there. It's getting a lot of buzz because of Academy Awards season this week, and it is a film called Flea from director Jonas Power Rasmussen. Uh, this is a film that comes out of Denmark. It's a uh, animated documentary um, about it, it's, it stars a man named Amin, um, and he is the subject matter of this. Uh, it's really him, as I say. It's a documentary just told through an animated style, um, and he, Amin and Jonas, the filmmaker, have been friends for years. Uh, ever since Amin uh, arrived in Denmark as a, a teenage refugee who had come from Afghanistan via Russia. Uh, and this film is, uh, I guess, Jonas, the, uh, the filmmaker, interviewing Amin over the course of time and allowing him to tell his story. And so we're listening to their actual audio as he's just recording Amin telling his story and, and, and Jonas will question him and kind of push him in different directions. And we're just listening to their actual their uh, actual audio, and then it's animated over the top with a beautiful animation style. But I'm going to get into that in a moment. Um, the story is that I'm in as a young boy in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Um, it, it was during the uncertainty of the Afghan Civil War. Uh, the Russians and the Mujahideen, uh, are, you know, there's, there's battles in Afghanistan. Um, his father disappeared, and they no, no one knew what happened. His father was just gone suddenly, and he and his he and his family, his siblings and his mother, realized we need to get out of Afghanistan. This is dangerous. This is bad. Uh, our dad just disappeared, and so they kind of risked it all to escape to Russia. Got some uh, human traffickers helped them escape to Russia, uh, and there they were faced with more trouble. It's 1980s uh, Russia as it's going through this weird time, you know, as the Cold War is ending. And they, they find that there's more trouble in Russia. 
and they attempted to flee from there as well. Uh, and Amin tells, just tells of the horrors that he went through through this time. And this film floats between all these animation styles. And often the animation styles are dependent on the mood and uh, the memory that he's telling. So sometimes when he's telling some really horrifying stories, there's like the, these nightmarish drawings that are done in charcoal, really crude, and you can just feel how, how dangerous and foreboding this, this is. And then it'll cut to a really beautiful full color animation as he remembers a memory that maybe wasn't so tragic, or he's talking about his mother. All of a sudden it cuts to a more beautiful uh, animation. Uh, what, my favorite thing about this, uh, the animation styles was, uh, at the beginning, he's asked, what's your first memory as a child? He says, well, it's 1984, I was in Afghanistan. And the song, Aha's Take On Me, starts playing. And the animation cuts to the very famous animation style from the Take On Me music video. And he, as a child, is riding around the streets on his bike, and he's listening to Take On Me as it has that great, iconic uh, animation style. I thought that was just, a, it was a beautiful choice. There was a lot of choices like that throughout here that were very uh, well done, really personal. Um, it's also peppered, uh, oddly, with, with actual footage that's not animated of, of things and events that he's talking about through here. And it's kind of a heartbreaking story about people without hope, people without a home, people who, who only have each other, um, moving constantly to avoid mistreatment by hostile groups. You never really have a home because a home is somewhere you feel safe and they didn't never have this. And everywhere they go, they're in fear. And you hear the pain in his voice, uh, the traumatic events that he's been through in his life, it, human traffickers and suffering. He's suffering now from guilt and PTSD and he's never able to let his guard down. Uh, and he's just living in fear and hiding his entire life. And hiding from police in Russia who were horrible to him, who were crooked, who stole from him and his family, and those who hated him uh, because of where he's from and what he looked like. And as we find also his sexual orientation, which he had to hide for fear of that being the thing that drove others to want to hurt him even more. So he's hiding from his, himself in this film. And he's never really able to find peace with himself through most of this film. And he tries to explain how all of this really affects you forever, how all of this trauma really affects you, affects relationships, uh, makes it really difficult to open up and to trust others. It's a really powerful film. Uh, I, I was really blown away by it. I found myself at the end of this film sitting there, just tears in my eyes, just kind of being overwhelmed by the, this young man's experience kind of washing over you and just how, how much he went through, where he's at today. And uh, it's, it's a powerful, powerful story. Um, and this week, oddly, I mean, it's getting a lot of buzz because this week it pulled off a really rare trifecta, one that I don't remember in recent memory, where with, uh, for Academy Awards, it uh, earned a nomination for Best Animated Film. It also earned a nomination for Best Documentary Feature Film, as well as Best International Feature Film as the representative from Denmark. So Best Foreign Language Film, Best Animated Film, and Best Documentary uh, all nominated for uh, Academy Awards for this film. It's, it's great. It's worth your time. It's one that uh, most times you would have to try and track down, but thankfully uh, it is sitting over on Hulu right now for you. So Flea is the name of this movie once again, uh, and I recommend it. I give it a four and a half out of five stars. It's, uh, it's worth the effort. It's an hour and a half of just beautiful storytelling. I think even if you... If you don't want to read the subtitles and you just watch this, the animation is so powerful, I think you would understand the story very well through that. So uh, I recommend Flea for sure. Now let's take a look back, though. Now, uh, uh, for our movie throwback segment, I went back to a movie that I hadn't seen in probably 25 years. I remember watching this when I was in high school, dating myself here, but uh, had been always told that this was an iconic film. I revisited just on a happenstance this week uh, and wanted to talk about it. It's from 1981. It's called My Dinner with Andre. Uh, My Dinner with Andre is directed by uh, Louis Mail, uh, stars Wallace Shawn as Wallace Shawn, or Wally as he's referred to, and Andre Gregory as the titular Andre. So what this film is, it's two old friends, Wally and Andre, who meet for dinner, and we sit and watch as they dine and share stories 
And that's about it. And that shouldn't work for a movie when that's basically the synopsis of it. Uh, it's just watching a conversation, mostly a one-sided conversation. Uh, the dynamic between the two of these men is interesting. Andre does most of the talking, kind of regaling with anecdotes and stories, talking in these long descriptive soliloquies, you know, just name dropping people and places and just really delving into things. And Wally kind of sits there for most of the film, kind of just asking for more. He's very happy to sit and listen. And when Andre's done talking, he's very happy to say, what else? Oh, okay, I'll give you some more. And it's just really, it's two performances that carry a movie. And the movie has been much lampooned and copied through the years in various forms. Um, I know Community did a whole episode about my dinner with Andre, which was great. Um, but you kind of just have a fly on the wall perspective to this table, uh, watching this intimate conversation between about life, about insecurities, relationships, a lot of introspection. And it's strange because I'm watching this and there's moments in here where I got lost in the story that Andre is telling because of his kind of matter of fact, rat-a-tat pace of telling stories. And I find myself uh, a couple of times with kind of the same confused look on my face that Wallace Shawn has at times. Uh, but then it's, it's the performances and the passion uh, that kind of draw me into it until I'm able to really catch up with the story again. Uh, you know, you, I, my mind may wander from what he's telling, but it's, I'm watching the faces and the reactions. And I love when finally Wallace Shawn uh, takes his turn to deliver the story because he's such an iconic character actor. I mean, he, he's Fizzini from, from Princess Bride. He's a one of a kind guy and his delivery and everything about him is so interesting. And uh, I love when he finally gets his turn and when you, you read about the background, I sat and read a lot about the, how this movie was made. And it was interesting because it was made really on a shoestring budget, 1981, because, you know, you just have a couple of cameras. And it, it was, it, it, they had no heat in the building. So you see these guys in sweaters. They're sitting on warming pads, heating blankets on their laps under the table because they're in a building with no heat. And they're shooting this in the winter months. Uh, and so it really was a film that was made uh, out, of, out of passion for it. And it shouldn't work in any way because it's just such a basic, basic premise. But it really does. It does in a really strange way. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure this is an acquired taste. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that say, this is, that's a boring movie. I I get it, but I would recommend you to at least give it a shot because My Dinner with Andre is, uh, is a film that kind of uh, set a new standard for what you could do with films and, and how much dialogue can really carry a movie. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I find myself really enjoying it once again. So uh, go check out My Dinner with Andre. Let's take a look ahead, though, at what is coming soon, the weekend of February 18th. We have three films that will be uh, on the marquee that week. The first one is a film called Uncharted. This is based on the adventure video game. Uh, stars Tom Holland. You know him as Spider-Man. We also have Mark Wahlberg in here in, uh, in Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider style adventure story. It looks pretty exciting. Uh, our first big action adventure film of the year. Uh, we also have a film called Dog. Dog stars Channing Tatum uh, as an army ranger who is uh, tasked with taking Lulu, who is an army ranger dog, uh, down the Pacific coast to the, a fellow soldier's funeral. Uh, and if you've ever seen Turner and Hooch, you know uh, how that's going to play out. It won't be easy. Uh, he doesn't get along with his dog. And uh, it's, it looks interesting. It's Channing Tatum and a dog, basically. So, I mean, I know it's what everyone's asked for. We're finally getting it. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the long tradition of rebooting horror franchises, long, long dormant horror franchises, uh, we are getting a new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, kind of following in the lines of what we've done with Halloween lately and, uh, and Chucky and rumors of rebooting other horror franchises. We had Scream, of course. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is back. This is supposed to be a spiritual remake of the 1974 cult classic film, kind of doing that thing where we cut out all the sequels and say this is where the actual sequel is supposed to be, uh, where some kids 
are out in the Texas desert and uh, they disrupt old Leatherface. And uh, I mean, if we're following the timeline, I guess Leatherface is like 80 years old at this point. I don't know. But uh, he's, he's out there and he doesn't like being bothered. And uh, he's going to do some things with the chainsaw. So that's all going to be happening the weekend of February the 18th. You want to check that out. Uh, before we go any further, though, we want to thank our sponsor, Marcus Theaters, the Palace here in Sun Prairie. Oh, we love you. I love going to the Palace, sitting down. It makes even a terrible movie like Moonfall uh, much more tolerable when I'm sitting in a dream lounger with a bucket of popcorn in my lap. Uh, it's great. Uh, and they've got a bunch of movies. It's, it's Oscar season. The nominations came out this week, as I said. So you can go there and uh, check out the Oscar-nominated movies that they have playing right now. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff going. You don't just have to go see bad sci-fi movies. Uh, go check out The Palace for all your movie needs. Uh, and uh, next week, I am not going to be all alone, fingers crossed. Uh, I'm going to be joined by a friend of the show, my boss, Jeff Robbins, is going to be stopping in as we talk about some movies. We're going to be talking about Death on the Nile, which is the uh, newest sequel in the Agatha, Agatha Christie novel franchise starring Daniel Craig. Uh, good mystery. We're also going to be talking about Marry Me, Jennifer Lopez and Owen Wilson in a, uh, in a Valentine's Day rom-com. And we also have Blacklight, which is the newest film starring Liam Neeson. I'm guessing he has a particular set of skills and he's willing to use them. I'm sure you've never seen a movie quite like Blacklight. So you want to tune in next week to find out what we thought of all of these films and so much more. If you want to find more from me, maybe you want to keep in contact with this show, maybe you want to throw your hat in the ring to be a guest host for the weeks when I'm sitting here all by my lonesome, you can find uh, us over on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. Real Reviews TV, at Real Reviews TV. Go over there, uh, chat with us. I love when I get messages from folks letting me know how, uh, how much they enjoyed something or how much they hated something that I said. Uh, I love it all. Again, I posted my list of uh, the entire rankings of all the movies that I saw last year. That's uh, sparked some discussion that uh, is always fun. Uh, so you can go find us over there on the social medias. Uh, but until next week, when I'm sitting here with Jeff Robbins, I'm Jameson. Have a great week.